And so we've talked about communication, we've talked about recruitment, collaboration, and dealing with change, all those kinds of things. We kind of covered that on our past three Zooms. Um, so today we're talking about kind of propagating those positive behaviors. So we want to talk about how we cultivate those behaviors and how we encourage them and then spread them throughout our organization. So that's really our theme for today with propagation. So um, we'll just dive right on into that. So when I talk about how you encourage others and how you spread those positive behaviors, what we're really talking about is leadership. And so Melody has provided us with this really nice graphic here that has all these different leadership roles, if you will. And you'll notice that these are not leadership titles like you would think of, because one thing I want you guys to remember is that leadership does not ever begin with a title. So you here have here your visionaries, your really principled people, your enthusiastic ones, your ones that are experts and your ones that are drivers and ones that are enhancers of your group. And sometimes you can be multiples of these. Sometimes you can kind of fall into different categories and different situations, however that fits for you. Um, but all of these people are important, but none of these really fit that definition of like a title. You wouldn't say, you know, oh, I'm the visionary of the Coffee County Master Gardeners, you know, because that's not the way we think about this, right? Um, so there's a lot of different ways that you can be a leader. So no matter what your role or even your title is, if you're going to be an effective leader, if you're going to be a leader that's productive, you need to have this right here. This is the key, the positivity. So instead of being the type of leader that sucks all the energy away, um, I kind of like this saying of be a fountain, not a drain, right? So you want to make sure you're putting more into your organization than you take out. So um, making sure that whatever you bring to the table is positive. So you might have noticed that all we've talked about is things that anyone can do, right? So from the very first day you sign up to be a Master Gardener in your intern class, you can be positive. You can be encouraging to others. Um, you, can, you can be an enhancer. You can help create a vision. You can do all those things from day one, right? So that's what I really like about this concept from um, John Maxwell of being a 360 degree leader. So in this leadership model, he talks about how as one person, no matter where you are in your organization or in your career path, you lead in all directions from around you. So you lead, we'll say down, in a way that, you know, you lead, we'll say we pull others along with you, right? Because if you've already been through the intern class, you lead by, reaching back and helping those that are coming up behind you to come forward with you, right? So we'll think about that as down because um, in like an organizational or like a business type, he talks about, you know, like people that are like in an actual leadership hierarchy kind of thing. So then you also have your leadership across your peers. So people that are also in your association, that were in your intern class, that are of the same age as you, have same interests as you, whatever, that's your leadership across, okay? And then you also lead up. So as a leader, you don't just lead to those that you think of, you know, that look up to you, but you also lead up to those that you might look up to or that you think of as having maybe more of a position in your organization. So you may not realize it, but from the minute you turn in that Master Gardener application, you have influence on this organization. So you have influence on your coordinators, on your board members, even on us as a work group for the whole state, you know, on Natalie. So you lead up to all of us. And that's because as a leader, it goes back to the positivity thing. And this quote that I heard a few weeks ago on a business podcast I was listening to, they said, you create culture with each encounter that you have. So every encounter you have with each other, with your coordinator, with anybody in this organization, you are influencing the culture of master gardeners at large. Because if you think about culture this way as the sum total of our interpersonal interactions, that's really what it is, right? So what are you bringing to the table? 
what are you bringing to those interactions? That's kind of um, the whole point, right? So that positivity piece and all that. So pull all that together. What are you cultivating? What are you bringing to that conversation? What are you bringing to the table? So this session is called propagating. So let's go back to that. Think about it this way. So if you're cultivating a garden, like this garden right here, I would love to have a cutting off of some of these things, right? Because it would really enhance my landscape or it would enhance my garden, make mine more full, would give it more texture, uh, make it more dynamic. But if this was just full of weeds and didn't have a lot of color and was just bland, I'd be like, nah, I don't really want a cutting from that. So what kind of culture are you cultivating? Are you cultivating the kind of culture in your association that someone else would want a cutting from? And when you are having those interactions, when you are leading something, what are you propagating? What are you adding to your garden or to your association? Is it something that someone else would want to cut in from? Is it adding something of value? Is it adding something that adds texture or something that adds some dynamic or some uh, color or something like that to your garden overall, your culture? So we're gonna propagate those good things and not the weeds, right? So how do we do that? We're gonna be an effective communicator, right? Because leadership isn't just about the title or it isn't just about, well, you know, about you or just me. It's about communicating with others. And that's kind of the point of those interactions. You have to communicate some way, whether verbally or non-verbally, there's communication happening. So we have to be effective. And I love this graphic that Melody found for us that really drives home the whole point of those interactions. And being an effective communicator has a lot to do with being clear about your intentions. And that's what I love about this little pie graph here. Being assertive is one of those things that some people feel like it has a negative connotation, but it's really what we should strive for because when you're assertive, you know what is best, or we don't know what's best, but you intend to find the best solution for everyone, right? So being an effective communicator and asserting your intentions and making sure that they're clear, right? Because I know that in life, this has happened to everyone where you have had someone say something to you or whatever, but their intention wasn't clear. You felt like maybe they were being aggressive or even passive aggressive, but that was not their intention, right? But they really had a win-win situation in mind, but that didn't come across in their communication. So having that clear articulation of your point is essential. But also keeping your goals and your purpose of your whole group in mind so that as a collective, you can find those win-win situations, right? But that isn't always the most easy or straightforward thing. The path to finding those win-win situations is not a straight line. A lot of times it has a lot of curves and dips to it, right? So sometimes the best leader, the most effective one in the whole group is that awesome moderator. Because if you've ever taken Melody's True Colors class, you know she's done it for my group every year. A lot of the other groups have her come and do it. It's really helpful to help you know which ones of us just need to think out loud. I'm one of those, I have to think out loud. If I'm gonna work through a problem or even just try to understand something, it has to come out my mouth for my brain to understand it. Like I have to hear it in my own voice, I guess, I don't know. <laughs> so um, as I have done more leadership training and done more of these kind of professional development things, I have learned that sometimes when us more bubbly talkative types that have to talk it all out, go about that process, it can make others who are not that way feel like they can't speak up or feel like they're not being heard, right? So while it's completely unintentional and we're intending to be productive and, you know, contribute to the conversation, at times that can unintentionally shut out others. And so sometimes the most effective leader is the one who sits back and listens and says to that really talkative one like me and says, Okay, so what I'm hearing you say is this, and so I think what you're getting at is this, this, and this, right? And I'll be like, yeah, that's right. And that kind of helps me clarify what I was getting to without having to ramble anymore. And 
look to the other person who hasn't said much that you know feels a little bit shut out because I'm over here like in my own little, oh, I got so excited and blah, blah, blah. Like I got a little orange over here and says, you know, I know you did it, this and that when you were in this organization or when you worked at so-and-so. So can you put something in or you know, can you contribute something here? Do you know about this here or what do you think about this? And having that personal connection and being able to make that person feel heard, feel seen and acknowledged and appreciated for what they bring to the table, that is so, so important. So being that effective listener to help the rambler <laughs> to feel heard and help them clarify their thoughts, but also to bring us all together as a group and to summarize what's been said so far is so super essential, but then too to bring in our more quiet ones and make them feel heard. So being that effective listener um, really is key. But on top of that, being a problem solver and really work, trying to work through those problems and making sure that as we're talking and as we're discussing things, we're moving forward. We're not just discussing, we're not just turning it over. Um, there's not a, this quote isn't on here, but it's one of my favorites is, you can't plow a field simply by turning it over in your mind. And you can't plow it just by flipping it over back and forth across the table either, right? So eventually you've got to just get in the field and plow it, right? So we need to make sure that we're cognizant of our discussions, cognizant of the way we're going about things, cognizant of our speech. So one of my other favorite quotes is from Teddy Roosevelt, complaining about a problem without posing a solution is called whining. And whining's not productive. It doesn't help anybody. It doesn't help you grow as a person or as an organization. Um, but I will edit this just a teensy bit um, because sometimes you don't know the solution, but you need help figuring it out, right? So I'll add the caveat, like, if you have the intention of finding a solution by talking about it, then that's not whining. Um, but <laughs> definitely, you know, if you just want to talk about it and just keep going on, but without trying to find a solution, then that's not productive. That is obviously not a big enough issue to be worrying about or wasting time thinking about if you're not willing to put in the work to fix it, right? So th think about being a problem solver. How can you fix things? Or how can you just move right along, right? So these are things that I deal with all the time as a 4-H agent. I'm, I'm a split agent, so 4-H and my other stuff. So I tell my kids this all the time, like, we're not doing whining. What are we going to do? How are you going to fix it? They're like, well, I don't know. Well, how about this? I don't want to do that. Well, is it that big of a deal then? They're like, well, no. I'm like, okay, go on. <laughs> so um, things we learn from an early age, but sometimes as adults, we forget. But no matter what your process is, if it's a problem or you're just trying to come up with new solutions, talking about new things that are coming along, remember that you come to this group with a huge amount of life experience that is valuable. So it doesn't have to be even plant related. A lot of my master gardeners come to us without a lot of plant experience and that's okay. That's not what makes them awesome master gardeners is when they have all the plant knowledge. That's not what makes them awesome master gardeners. What makes them awesome master gardeners is when they have other skills that they're willing to, you know, devote to our group and willing to learn and they're willing to just put forth the work and be in it together. So, <laughs> like, what comes to mind for me with this is that little song I used to sing in Sunday school when I was a kid. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine, right? So, like, whatever skills you bring from your past life experiences, don't, don't hide them. You know, don't feel like you don't have something to contribute just because you don't have a lot of plant knowledge or whatever it is. Um, in my group this year, we had an intern who she was really worried about how she's going to get her hours. And I found out she does photography on the side. And I was like, hey, we really need um, some photos done for our directory. And oh my gosh, y'all, our directory photos are gorgeous. Like she did such a good job. And so you never know what skills that you need in your organization until sometimes they come along and then you're like, oh yeah, we needed that. Um, so remember that you bring a lot to the table from past experiences and we're an organization of a lot of people. 
We need all the skills. We need things because there's a lot going on here. So, you know, don't, don't discredit yourself for those things and just, you know, leave from your experience and you don't have to have a position like we've talked about. So just help each other along. And remember that everyone brings something to the table. And so as you're leading in your group and looking at your um, new interns that are coming in and looking to create new projects, look for those skills that maybe haven't been tapped yet. So look for those things that you don't have in your garden or in your culture or in your group being used, right? So if you're looking at your group and you're saying, you know, we, we do this really well, but it's kind of, our projects all kind of look the same. And you look at it and it just seems flat. It doesn't have a lot of different things going on. You don't have a lot of variety, right? Maybe look at your new interns or whoever in your group and say, hmm, they all had different careers, they all had different things they did before they you know, before they were master gardeners or that they're still doing. What are we not seeing? And those are the things that sometimes you can go and find, you know, a little bit and propagate it and it spreads, right? That's how propagation works, right? You're spreading those things that you like. So going to that person and saying, hey, I remember you talking about when you did this and that. How could we apply that here? Or what kind of project could we make that's like that? Those kinds of things. Because having people that bring those things to the table and helping them to feel seen, that is what helps your organization to grow. Hey, Rachel, can you share what you told me that Carlos tells you all the time? I won't get it right. Yes. So, uh, another agent, but she is in the consumer sciences, and I call her my office mom because everybody needs one of those. And um, so she always tells me, you know, whenever I'm getting frustrated or something, she's like, look, what we do is we give people purpose. Everybody needs a purpose in life. And she actually will always share a statistic. I don't remember what it is. But um, basically, if someone is living without a purpose, it is more dangerous to their health than smoking. That's a big deal. So, um, you know, we give people purpose. We bring them into an organization and we give them something to do and people that need their help. They need their knowledge. They need their skills. So by giving them that, that opportunity to be a master gardener and to join this other group of people that believe in the same thing they do, we are helping their health. And so she reminds me that and I'm like, man, I am ready to go change the world because People need a purpose, and you have the ability to give them that. So, pep talk for your Friday morning. Thank you. Yeah, Rachel shared that with me the other day, and I just loved it. So, thank you, Rach. Um, yeah, so look for those things in your people. Um, you know, I have heard things in my life, you know, like treat everyone like they have a sign around their neck that says, like, make me feel special, you know. Um, but really, everyone comes to Master Gardener for a different reason, and we all end up here together, and really, there's a reason that we're all here, and to make each other feel special, and to tap into those resources, right, because we're here to serve our community, and if we're not making the most of the gifts and the skills that we have, we're not serving them to the best of our ability. We're not serving each other. We're not serving our community to the best of our ability yet, right? So there's always more um, that, than we realize. So, oh, sorry. Um, <laughs> so um, there's always more that maybe we aren't, we aren't seeing, right? So look for those things in, in others. You might be surprised what you find sometimes. But like Rachel said, we serve a greater purpose. And so that is more, more than work. For whatever your reason was for joining Master Gardener, I guarantee you it wasn't because you just love to fill out um, all your hours in the database. <laughs> like I guarantee you that wasn't like your jam. Even if you're super good at it now and you're super good at helping your fellow Master Gardeners, I doubt that was your reason, <laughs> right, for doing that kind of stuff. Okay, so the work side of things, while it's important, um, and you know, doing your more worky stuff is important, but give yourself a break too, right? 
So make sure you're taking time for yourself. And remember that we are an organization that cares about people and taking care of your health and taking care of your whole person. So this makes me think about, you know, I said I'm a split agent, I do 4-H and I think, and I do Master Gardener. So when I was preparing for this, I was like, you know, I don't know why the 4-H pledge isn't just like the whole extension pledge because it's really our goal for all of the extension. Because in, if y'all don't know, the 4-H pledge, we pledge our head to clear thinking and our heart to greater loyalty, our hands to larger service and our health to better living. And so, you know, that's really what we do in Master Gardener. We, when we focus on, you know, our head and our knowledge with our intern class from the get-go. But then when we really get into our groups, that greater loyalty piece and those friendships that we make, that is so important in those connections, right? That is so important. And then obviously the service piece, that's the other half of Master Gardener besides the education, right? Like just on, the, on its face, on paper. And then the health aspect, you know, I did a whole talk in February um, for a group of retired teachers about the health benefits of gardening. And it was awesome, all the research that I found. So um, there's a huge benefit to people's lives here. Um, and I know y'all have experienced that. So remember that though, remember to enjoy the full breadth of Master Gardener, not just the work part. And remember to encourage others to do the same and put your people first because we are about people. Um, we're a people organization who just happen to love plants. We're not a plant organization run by people, okay? It's not the other way around. So put your people first. And then just cultivate the good. Encourage those new ideas and new projects, whatever it is. And then create new teams. If, it, if you need a new team to run those projects, make it. If you need to make a new award to recognize those things that are happening, do it. Whatever it takes recognize that stuff that's happening recognize the efforts that are being made those little nuggets of awesomeness we're talking about earlier that you may not know your organization needs yet or that people may not know that they bring to the table that's so essential that you have you know kind of found and encouraged and it starts to grow keep encouraging it keep pushing it right so recognize it start an award start whatever it you know whatever it takes um because people who feel appreciated will always go above and beyond, right? And not only that, I love this other quote, when you're green, you're growing, but when you're ripe, you're rot. So stay green, stay green and keep growing and keep encouraging future growth, right? Keep making cuttings, keep staying green, keep making more little greens and just keep it going, all right? Because that's how you'll grow your organization because you guys are fabulous and we want more of y'all's fabulousness. So thank you. All right, Anna, thank you very much. We, you were, you were getting like some, you know, preach it, go for it girl in the uh, comment <laughs> section there. So thanks so much for um, opening <laughs> us up with that. Do you want to share a little bit about the four groups, Anna? Oh, sure, sure. Okay. Um, so our four groups today are, um, one will be like, how do we support our interns? Because I mean, they're like our newly little propagated little root, uh, little cuttings, you know, they're, they're new here and we got to support them and keep them going so they can root. Um, our other one is called, oh, and I'll be in the intern one. Our other one is what does it mean to be a leader? And Melody, you got that one? Yeah. Is that right? No. I think that's Chris. Chris, that's, oh, that's Chris, okay, my bad. Um, and then creating culture is, is Melody, that's right, okay, so yeah. So Chris is doing, what does it mean to be a leader? So really kind of diving more into that definition of what we talked about today of being a leader, what it means for you guys as master gardeners. Melody's gonna really dive into that culture piece. What do you want your culture to look like for your group and for our whole association as a state? And then Rachel is going to help us define our purpose. So I'm super excited about that because y'all already heard from her a little bit on that. So y'all have fun with that one. So oh, I don't mind to go first. That's fine. Okay, cool. Um, so my group was, we talked about how do we support our interns? And the first question I asked them was, tell me something that helped you feel welcome. And the biggest thing I heard was, speak to me as an individual. Come and talk to me as one person. Um, so 
over and over I heard people that, you know, they walked in their first meeting and someone came to them, said, hi, how are you? Tell me about yourself. You know, something like that where they all of a sudden weren't in a room with all these people alone. Now they knew someone. Now they had someone they go sit with. Now they had someone that they knew. And on the flip side, I also heard a story of where that didn't happen and where that they didn't want to ever come back. They did, but they, did, they felt like I'm in this room. No one has said a word to me. I don't want to come back. You know, that's, that's an awful feeling. We never want to do that to anyone, right? Um, the other thing that I thought was cool was one group, um, they did an activity where they shared like their name and then like five significant things like a hobby or where they're from or something like that. And then they went and found people who had commonalities with them. And so it really helped them to form those connections just based off those um, early things that you learn about somebody. Um, and it helped them to kind of go ahead and get to know people a little bit very quickly. Um, so that was the big thing. And then um, assigning mentors, but just having that, having your person, right, to kind of get you started. The other thing was, I asked them was, how do you connect? Like, how, what, help, what helped you connect or really put your roots in and say, I'm a master gardener and really feel like you belong? What helped you? And the biggest thing was invite your interns to things. There's a huge difference in saying, come if you want, and I want you here. Those are two very different statements. And they mean so much different, so many, they mean totally different things to the person you're saying it to. So invite them to participate. It makes them feel seen. It makes them feel valued when they are personally invited to be a part of a team or part of a project. Um, that means the world to people. Um, and in the same vein, um, Greg talked about making sure that you have some kind of succession plan for those projects, right? Because you have these projects that are established and you have people that get really comfortable in doing them and kind of managing them and they end up kind of being the go-to person. And what happens if your go-to person moves or for whatever reason isn't able to, to fulfill that anymore? All of a sudden you kind of have this big void. And if they haven't been sharing that, information or that duty with anybody else, then it's kind of hard for everyone else to kind of fill that in. And so making sure that you are inviting your interns to be part of everything, not just the new stuff, not just stuff that interns typically do or whatever, but all of it, all of it, so that your group can keep on. So you have a succession plan and it can keep continuing on um, for many years to come. So that was the big thing. Oh, and they, everyone loves Rachel's growth team. And so we're all taking a cutting from that idea. Thanks, Rach. <laughs> uh, so um, let's see. So we want to do maybe leaders next. Yeah, we can do leaders. Anna, thank you for your presentation. It was real good. I like the hands and I like the singing. That was real cool. Oh, <laughs> thanks. Oh. <laughs> yeah, so we, we had a real discussion in my group, y'all. We talked about leaders and what does it mean to be a leader. So the first question was, how does a leader speak? And I'm just going to throw out, you know, uh, some of the responses that I got. Respectfully, with confidence, encouraging, uh, consideration. I like this one, humility. And the last one was uh, wisdom uh, that we talked about. How does a leader act, y'all? With confidence, right? Friendly, uh, intentionality. I like that one. Active listener, welcoming uh, input, uh, speak naturally. And how about this one, y'all? Eye contact. All right, that, that was pretty cool. Okay, how does a leader make others feel? Get this, y'all. Positively, it'd be positive or negative, right? Positive or negative. So here's some of the things that were thrown out: valued, included. I like this one. Empowered. Um, they empower you to make a change. Uh, purpose looks different for people. Um, I think that was the last one on that. And what leaders in your group do you think of first and why? So someone I can relate to, uh, someone that's a dedicated member. Uh, we have one agent who was called out, Tom Stebbins, uh, was mentioned, uh, because he uh, he's well-respected, he's knowledgeable, uh, he's resourceful and encouraging. So there you go, Mr. Tom, that was real good. Uh, Miss Martha uh, there in Fayette County was mentioned for her energy 
And I would like to call out all of the extension agents. We were listed as leaders, okay? So all of you extension agents, you should give yourselves a round of applause for that, okay? And then lastly, I really like this one, okay? Those who care about the mission are considered to be leaders. I like that one. I'm done, Anna. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. That was awesome. All right. Um, let's see. We want purpose or culture next. Rach, Melody, who wants it? Melody. Okay. <laughs> okay. So creating culture. Um, we started out just using one word to describe the culture of our groups and then moved into, or if we didn't have a, a good word to describe that, what we wish that could be. So I'm going to throw these out. Hang on. Uh, supportive, accepting, transforming, open to new ideas, collaborative, passionate, family-like, open, innovative, productive, nurturing, enthusiastic, um, transparency, above and beyond, active, encouraging, cohesive. Some of those might have been on there twice, sorry. Uh, but one of the, the key things I think too that we discovered in our group is how there was ideas that kind of merged all four of our groups. So you could kind of see where it was kind of spinning off into all of our um, small group sessions. Uh, but some of the, the last question we had was, what are the essential ingredients of that culture? And basically some of these things we've already heard from, but from Anna and from Chris, but inviting all people to, to join. Um, initially do that internally to make everyone feels like, feel like they have a, a place uh, within the group. Uh, mentorship was mentioned several times, making sure we uh, team up our fermented folks with some of our new interns and maybe uh, institute a little bit more of a, a process for that to in, engage both of those audiences. Uh, more acceptance of all ideas uh, was, was uh, mentioned a couple of times, just inclusion of all people, thoughts and ideas. Um, Get, getting to know your people, having some of those social interactions and engagements. And of course, as we move through the next three months, that's gonna be a little bit more difficult. We've heard that mentioned several times in some of our Zoom meetings. Um, let's see here. You know how my handwriting is, folks. Uh, but yeah, I think Branson was the one that brought it up again, that the more that you can do with your group um, and actually encourage our folks to get to know one another, then the easier it is going, to, the easier it's going to be on agents and the membership to determine what those talents and skill sets are for all members, whether they be, uh, again, some of our um, older members, not older, I'm going back to what Sandra said, our fermented folks that have been active <laughs> members for a while, you know, make sure that we keep them engaged, uh, that may not be able to do some of those physical um, projects as, as well as maybe they used to be, uh, making sure that we bring those interns on boards. Again, just being more accepting, more inclusive of everyone, all those thoughts and ideas, not, you know, just everyone is a part of our local group. They're a part of the state group. Everybody brings something to the table. We all contribute. And ultimately that's what grows the culture and the, the purpose and the passion. Go on virtual field trips. That's all, all right. I got, Anna. All right. Nice. Awesome. Thanks, Melody. All right, Rach, let's define our purpose. Woo. All right. So purpose. I know we've already shared this and everything, but, um, you know, we really just talked about if you know your purpose and you feel led to carry out that purpose, then hopefully you're passionate about it, right? So basically, we want to figure out our purpose and we want to be passionate about it. And so we just had a basically a little fire up session about um, becoming more passionate about our purpose and knowing what our purpose is. Because if you know your purpose, you're just going to change the world and you're going to change people's lives. So as a master gardener, you are invited on this journey to join Extension Agents um, and come alongside them to change your community. And so, um, I don't know if you've ever read our mission statement, hopefully, um, but if not, please go look that up and um, become familiar with it. And then just write your own 
mission statement, right? Write your own purpose statement. So I don't know if you've ever written a purpose statement before, but we have one already written by our listening session from the fall. So Master Gardeners all came together and we had these great meetings where everybody just talked about, you know, why am I here? Why am I still here? You know, members that are here, you know, 20 something years, woo, you know, they are still fired up about it too, let me tell you. So if you can stay that fired up about something for 20 something years, what do you think is gonna happen? Other people are gonna join you, right? Because you're so excited about what you're doing and it means so much to you. But I think as Master Gardeners, whenever someone asks, you know, what do you do as a Master Gardener? You start listing off these projects over here, don't you? Yeah, I'm, shake your heads, you know you do. You're like, oh, we speak at the senior center and the library and we do this and that. No, you change people's lives. That's what we do, right? So whenever somebody asks you, what do you do as a master gardener? I want you to have a statement that knocks people's socks off and they just want to jump in the, the bandwagon too. They want to get on that party wagon, right? Because it is a party and it's fun and we have fun and we want other people to join us, not just anybody. We want other great people that want to have a passion for this too to join us, right? So we want to uh, bring in, like Anna's been talking about, we want to propagate that culture and that fun and that passion for what we're doing. And we want to bring those other people that could be, you know, part of this too in. So how do we do that? We are excited about it. We are passionate about it. And we share with them more than just what we do, you know. We share with them why we do it. Because nobody wants to join you if they, you know, hear, oh, we go and we weed the demonstration garden. No, they don't want to get on on that. They're like, I got my own weeds over here, honey. So we have got to tell them why we are doing it, okay? So if we share with them why we are doing something instead of what we are doing, why? And then you get into the what, you know, when they're already kind of in the group. You're like, yeah, we're going to go weed this. Then... They know why they're doing it and they're okay with doing it because they're excited about it and they know that you are going to show off that demonstration garden and everybody in the whole state of Tennessee is going to come and visit it because it's so pretty and that's why you're doing it right because you're passionate about it so anyways I just hope that y'all are fired up too because I am and not even COVID-19 can bring down the master gardener spirit and now my neighbor is using his chainsaw so anyways I will be quiet now but you know what? Even a pandemic can't break us down. All right, thank you. Woo, thank you, Rach. I had nothing else to add to that. Like, that's it. Thank you. Woo. <laughs> I mean, I think we'll just say, amen, close the meeting. I, I like it. <laughs> um, Next week uh, is our county communicator visit. You'll get emails. We'll keep y'all in date, uh, up to date. But uh, keep the passion, um, maintain your purpose, and uh, we look forward to a fabulous summer with y'all under these very unexpected circumstances. Thank you, thank you, and have a great rest of your weekend. Thank you, Natalie.